Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our briefing today about building out electric vehicle charging infrastructure. I'm Dan Brissett, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. The Environmental and Energy Study Institute was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics for policymakers. More recently, We've also developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs to help make energy efficiency, beneficial electrification, and renewable energy more accessible and affordable for their customers. EESI provides informative, objective, nonpartisan coverage of climate change topics in briefings, written materials, and on social media. All of our educational resources, and that includes briefing recordings, fact sheets, issue briefs, articles, newsletters, and podcasts, are always available for free online at www.eesi.org. If you would like to make sure you always receive our latest educational resources, the best way to do it is to subscribe to our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. Today is part three of our briefing series, Scaling Up Innovation to Drive Down Emissions. We have already covered green hydrogen on April 27th and direct air capture just last week. Our final briefing in the series will be offshore wind energy, which will happen later this month. To review presentation materials and summary notes and RSVP for what comes next, check out our resources at www.eesi.org. Our companion briefing series, Living with Climate Change, is also currently underway. So far, we have learned about the climate adaptation and resilience challenges posed by the polar vortex and sea level rise. Our next briefing in the series will be about wildfires on June 13th, and that will be followed by extreme heat later this month. Again, you can sign up for the whole set by visiting us at www.eesi.org forward slash briefings. Unlike green hydrogen and direct air capture, electric vehicle supply equipment, which is the formal name for EV chargers, is relatively commonplace. In fact, I would bet everyone watching the live cast today has at least seen a level two charger in a parking lot or garage at the mall, near an office building, or maybe at an airport. And I would also bet the same cannot be said about facilities and equipment necessary to produce low or no carbon hydrogen or remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. But relatively commonplace does not mean we have enough of these things. Think about how many gasoline pumps and service stations you've used or seen in the last year. It's a number probably too high to count with any confidence. And even without the specifics, it is certainly way, way more than the number of electric vehicle charging stations you've come across. Electric vehicles are the future at least for those of us who rely on cars and trucks and SUVs to get around on a daily basis. Internal combustion engines that run on fossil fuels still outnumber their electric counterparts for now. According to the 2022 Sustainable Energy in America Factbook, electric vehicle sales doubled from about three, uh, 326,000 in 2020 to about 657,000 vehicles in 2021. And more and more automakers are in the game, which gives consumers more and more models and configurations to choose from than ever before. Nobody, have I, have, nobody I have ever talked to uh, predicts that the upward trend of EV sales will slow down from this point forward. And that brings us to our briefing today. Electric vehicle adoption is a critical element of decarbonizing the transportation sector, which accounts for about 29% of total U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. And a significant barrier to greater and faster adoption of EVs is the insufficient state of the charging infrastructure necessary to support tens of millions of electric vehicles. So what are we going to do about this? This need is widely understood and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act enacted last year provides $7.5 billion to put 500,000 public charging stations in service. And that is above and beyond what other federal programs like the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Rural Energy Savings Program are already supporting, not to mention all the private investment. In addition to the deployment challenges of reimagining our vehicle refueling network to support all the new EVs on the road, I am especially interested in how utility regulation, policies like building energy codes, and our own behavior will evolve. Our panelists will help us understand these dynamics and other considerations as well. Before we turn to our panel, let me remind everyone that we will have some time at the end of our session for questions, and we will do our best to incorporate questions from our audience. If you have a question, there are two ways you can send it to us. First, you can send us an email, and the email address to use is ask at eesi.org. That's A-S-K at eesi.org. Or even better, you can follow us on Twitter at eesionline, 
and send it to us that way uh, by retweeting or responding to the live tweeting thread. And bonus points if you use the hashtag, hashtag EESI talk. Our first panelist is Catherine Stankin. Catherine is the Vice President of Policy at the Electrification Coalition. She leads and manages the policy team at the EC, which is focused on electrifying the transportation sector. Her work spans across city, state, regional, and federal levels. Catherine, welcome to the briefing today. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Great, thanks so much for having me, Dan. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. It is still um, morning here on the West Coast. So I'm in Arizona. Um, so I think you can all see my slides now. And here we go. Um, great. So again, thanks for inviting me here to talk today. And um, I, one of the most exciting things that we could be talking about um, in today is EV charging infrastructure and EVs just because of the impact it has on all of our lives. Um, so my name is Catherine Stankin. I'm the Vice President of Policy, as Dan said, at the Electrification Coalition, which is a nonprofit bipartisan organization that's working to accelerate adoption of EVs in order to reduce the economic and national security threats caused by our dependence on oil. And our sister organization is SAFE. They were formerly known as Securing America's Future Energy, but now they go by SAFE. And they lead a broader approach that's focused on the supply side and the critical minerals needed for the batteries, um, but it's the same core mission of getting to mass adoption of EVs. So we have direct experience working at the local, state, and federal levels, and that includes acting as the lead implementer for transportation for the US DOT's Smart City Challenge, working with 25 leadership cities through the American Cities Climate Challenge, working with companies like Pepsi to provide technical support to accelerate freight electrification, and working directly with states around the country to provide technical and policy support. And in terms of our state work, um, that's the uh, center square there, our state EV policy accelerator, you can see the states that we are mostly focused on, um, also Illinois, Wisconsin, um, Ohio, and Indiana. So I am going to give a lay of the land across the federal level, state and city level, and the utility landscape about where we are. And Dan already provided some of those numbers, but um, hopefully we'll put it all in context and you'll get the big picture of all that is going on in this space. And then at the end, I'm gonna talk about what's on the horizon and what um, I'm looking forward to. So with the federal level, obviously you're probably all aware of the bipartisan infrastructure law. And on the left there, there's certain uh, dedicated funding streams for EV charging infrastructure. So the 5 billion that's going to be building out EV infrastructure along the highways, that's the NEVI uh, funding, as we like to call it, the National EV Infrastructure uh, Program. Then there's the 2.5 billion in competitive grants available which with there's a 50% set aside uh, for community specific grants with a priority for rural and underserved communities. And then there's also 2.5 billion available for electric school buses um, and also another 2.5 billion set aside for zero emission and low emission buses. Now that's not just the buses, the EPA did make a clarification that the charging infrastructure for those buses is also permitted. Um, so with the NEVI funding though, I mean, states are currently hard at work in developing their plans those are due August 1st, um, and they'll be approved on a rolling basis by the DOT and the DOE, and hopefully all approved by mid-September. And this is really exciting work because it's bringing together a lot of different players in the states that haven't all necessarily um, worked together before. So, example, you know, this, the, the state transportation offices, the energy offices, the air offices, and now also the utility commissions and the utility boards. Um, just a note, too, about the electric school bus program there. That um, funding opened up um, May 22nd, I believe. Um, the first round of funding is 500 million that's available. And the EPA is going to prioritize applications in high need local education agencies, tribal schools, and rural areas. Um, all the additional programs there from the bipartisan infrastructure law, those are listed on the right. And some of those were already existing programs, but they had an, an increase in funding. Um, attributed to him, or there was a clarification within the legislative language that now allows for EV charging infrastructure to be eligible. Um, but that is not dedicated EV funding there. Um, but now that we do have all these programs, we need to get the word out about them. And so that'll bring me to my next slide there, which is about agency coordination. So let me find my notes. Okay. So lots of um, agency coordination happening right now. Obviously there's the new joint office that was formed between the DOE and the DOT. And what's really great about this is that they're offering technical assistance to states. So nobody, no state should feel like they don't know what to do or who to reach out to. I think it's very clear and the, the DOT and DOE has done a great job with that. 
there's also been a lot of material provided um, in terms of where EV charging infrastructure is applicable, um, not only under the bipartisan infrastructure law on the current on the last slide, I showed that right hand column with all the different programs, but the White House back in April of last year provided um, some clarity working with the DOT about where um, EV charging infrastructure is eligible. And so on the right, you can see that's um, uh, just a screenshot there of where um, you can see a little charging icon under which programs it's eligible. But um, the DOT also have um, released their rural EV toolkit. And that second picture, there's a screenshot of the cover. And on pages 73 to 83 there, there are dozens of programs where EV charging infrastructure can be eligible. I will say though, that those are not, um, again, not EV specific programs. And so, and many of them are oversubscribed every year because they're so popular. So um, that'll just highlight the need that we, we need additional um, funding at the federal level to support the deployment of EV infrastructure. Now the EPA, they also have their Queen's School Bus website um, up and running, and they also are providing technical assistance to school districts. Um, and then with the NEVI deployment principles there. So as we're working with the states, um, these are some of the ways that we're helping states to think through what their plan should look like. And the DOT, there's specific guidance about what that state plan needs to entail, and there's a very specific template and all. But states are also not just thinking about this funding as a one-time opportunity. They're thinking about how can this already um, how can it dovetail with some of their existing programs or with their own state deployment goals? So we're encouraging states to um, have this be a seamless EV charging experience across the board for light duty drivers and medium heavy duty drivers. And so when we mean 100%, we mean that we want to see all states be taking advantage of this funding at the federal level. Um, we did not see that happen necessarily for some of the Volkswagen settlement funding that um, was available for deploying EV charging infrastructure. So that's a big priority for us to make sure that all states are taking advantage of this. Reliable, I think that is self-explanatory, same effective, um, equitable. With high quality, we would like to see um, these programs at the federal level be creating high quality jobs and a strong American supply chain. And what I mean by connected is also that, um, as I mentioned, that the, the states are, the agencies are now working across the board with one another, transportation office, air office, energy office, but with the utility board or the utility commission in that state, what are the additional policies and programs that need to be adopted there? Does the utility commission need to be making a statement about EV rates, uh, rate design, managed charging programs, encouraging the, their investor owned utilities to be putting forward programs along those lines, um, that kind of thing. And what I mean by affordable there too, is that each state has identified a pathway for meeting that 20% cost share requirement for the NEVI funding um, and a pathway for leveraging further uh, um, public private partnerships and private investment. So you may have already known that about the federal level, but now about the state and the city level landscape, there is so much that has been going on over the years. Um, and what the federal funding does is really help to just now layer on top of what's been um, brewing at the state level, I should say, and what we're excited to see even more activity um, and investment in and through. So with corridor programs, uh, what I mean by this is something like the Nevada Electric Highway, the Rev West Agreement, the Northeast Corridor Regional Strategy, which goes from Maine to DC. And some of that did, um, as states made those agreements, um, some of them, the states did commit funding towards building out EV infrastructure along those specific corridors. Um, others did not, it was just the agreement, but that does then show the state intent to further support the development of EV infrastructure and signals the state's um, recognition that EVs are the future. With re rebate programs, um, these have been funded at the state level. Um, originally, they probably, most of them started with funding all alt fuel infrastructure. Um, and now most of them are focused on just electric vehicles uh, infrastructure alone. Um, we do in, there's a screenshot there of um, our Achieve Model Policy Toolkit, which would go into a lot of detail about those rebate programs, which state has them, what's the funding level, what it looks like, the details, et cetera, who's eligible. Um, so I'll just point you to that Achieve Model Policy Toolkit. And we do have an update of that coming out later on this summer. Deployment goals, states obviously have, um, you know, they'd like to see 500,000 chargers on the road um, or, or deployed by X date, that kind of thing. Um, with the Volkswagen settlement funds, now just to put some numbers towards this amount of the funding. So if you all recall, there was two parts to this in terms of the EV um, 
EV charging infrastructure. There's the Appendix C and the Appendix D. So Appendix C was the entity that formed Electrify America, which would be um, requiring Volkswagen to then commit $2 billion over 10 years. That was not just all for electric charging infrastructure, though probably a good chunk of that was, but um, that was $2 billion. And as Dan had mentioned, and I showed 7.5 billion is what we now have at the federal level. So significantly more and really helping us to launch us into this electric transportation future. The other piece of the Volkswagen settlement funding, that is the Appendix D. And um, that's what I mentioned that not all of the states took advantage of this um, in terms of how much they could put towards EV infrastructure. Um, a certain piece of that was going to allow them to put 15% of that funding towards it and not all um, states unfortunately did. In terms of the EV reading, EV ready wiring codes and ordinances, um, this is more at the city level, but we're seeing a lot of new best practices be developed here on how to be ready for all this funding and investment coming and um, not having to rip up parking lots and do a lot of retrofits, which is going to save states and cities a lot of money. Right of way charging programs, we're also seeing a lot of um, best practices start to emerge here. Um, there's been a number of pilot programs done just at cities, um, probably not so much statewide, but just more city level or local level. Um, and for anyone that doesn't know what that is at right of way charging, that's that's allowing for um, infrastructure to be built kind of on the sidewalk. So um, sometimes there's that little strip of grass between you know, where you might see a tree planted or something. It's putting um, a charging infrastructure there. And depending on how um, the city is or the local level is with jurisdiction, um, that could either be um, the, the city might have control over that or it might be the, the property owner. So there's definitely some policy um, needed there to clarify that. Um, Multi-unit dwellings, I think that's probably self-explanatory. And then with clean fuel standards, this is something I just wanted to highlight because this is becoming more and more um, popular, I guess, or it's, it, there's a lot of interest growing on this at the state level. Um, and so this is, in California at least, it's, it is a market-based mechanism, so you can't exactly say how much a policy like this is worth in terms of the credit value and, and the pot of money, I guess. But um, let's just say the scale is at about hundreds of millions of dollars. Now these credits, um, in terms of the overall program, um, electricity is a clean fuel, so it does, it's starting to receive more and more of that credit value. Um, and then devil's in the details, so to speak, about how that credit money would get spent. Is that going back to the driver of the vehicle? Is that going back to the utility? Is that going back to um, some kind of partnership with the state as well to build out EV infrastructure? So we're starting to see some um, unique creative policies um, and, and how the credits are shaped um, be developed at the state level. Um, and, and Washington State is probably one to watch right now. And then there's a whole lot more. Um, so I spent a lot of time federal and city level, now I'll speed up to get through the rest of this. But utilities, they have been investing in EV infrastructure as well. This chart here just shows their investment um, between 2012 and kind of the start of all of this and June of 2021. Um, so that's about three billion that the utilities have been investing so far. Um, you can see the on the left side, the approved column, what that equals in terms of DC fast charging stations and level two stations. Excuse me, we are now see, starting to see more utilities um, move away from just the pilot programs and to do big full scale programs. And that's usually um, along the lines of hundreds of millions of dollars there. So what is on the horizon? Um, well, there's the, first of all, I think it's just important to note that the federal level has the right scale and scope. And so that's why we are heavily focused on um, the federal level and look forward to working with all of you in the audience listening to this. But you could see a list of some of the things there. Um, for us, a big priority is a long-term extension of the 30C alternative fuel refueling property tax credit. Um, there's other additional policies that were um, already thought through on the house side under the Build Back Better um, program there. Um, what, for example, the funding for electrifying the federal fleet um, for uh, the GSA, but also the US Postal Service. And that included um, funding for the EV infrastructure deployment as well for that. There's certain um, programs under the appropriations process that's going on right now. We're looking forward to the guidance from the DOT and the DOE on standards for the charging stations. Um, there's We support allowing for EV charging infrastructure to be built out at rest stops. And this is something that would have, have to happen legislatively um, through Congress as well. And then I just listed a couple other things here, the EVs for All Act, EVs in Underserved Communities Act, 
um, allowing REAP funding to be used for installing EV infrastructure on American farms, and then um, the EPA's renewable fuel standard policy. Um, looking forward to seeing uh, what the EPA might be recommending for allowing electricity to be electricity to be a pathway there that would uh, generate credits. So that was a lot, but um, I'm going to pass it now um, to back to Dan. It was a lot, but it was expertly presented. <laughs> so Catherine, thank you very much uh, for your great presentation. Uh, and a great reminder to me to remind my audience or our audience that all of Catherine's presentation materials, and this goes for the other panelists as well, they're all available online at www.esi.org. So Catherine's slides were quite good. If you'd like to go back and revisit them, it's very easy to do. And of course you can watch, also watch the archived webcast. Our second panelist today is Joe Inglisa. Joe is the Vice President of Business Development at SemiConnect. SemiConnect is a leading provider of electric vehicle amenities to the North American commercial and residential property market. He joined SemiConnect in 2011, just as they started commercial sales. And when he's not working, he loves the great outdoors and volunteering in his community. Joe, great to see you. I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Dan. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be a, a part of this panel and this group. And, uh, Thank you to the EESI team for all the work that they're doing. Um, yeah, so that said, my name's Joe Inglisa. I, I am with SemiConnect. Our world headquarters is in Bowie, Maryland. That puts us in between Washington, D.C. and the beautiful Chesapeake Bay. Um, ha have been with the, the company uh, a little more than uh, 10 years. So I, I think what I'm going to try to do is just you know, kind of give your uh, give an educational perspective uh, from a, a manufacturer, um, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, you know who we are on the next slide. Um, so again, we we are the uh, a manufacturer and the software uh, developer. So what that means is we uh, we build the chargers, we operate the network for the the the, the buyer. So that means they own the chargers. It's up to them to make them because they own the charger and they, they do the installation through their own preferred electrical contractor. It means that they could either make them public or they could make them private. They could either make them complimentary or they could charge a fee for the, the, the revenue. So when you see our chargers deployed out there and you may see an expensive rate, that's not some connect charging you the driver. It's actually the, the owner. Um, so that's what we do. Our, our core focus in the beginning was what um, I'm going to refer to as L2 or level two. And what that means is 208 or 240 volt uh, chargers. And so it's a very common uh, um, electrical infrastructure, very available. Um, so our focus in terms of customers were uh, uh, commercial real estate, even just workplace charging, employers wanting to put them in for their employees to help um, encourage them to, to buy electric vehicles. Um, and then the other half of commercial real estate is what's called commercial multifamily, and that's uh, apartments and condos. But that said, I'm proud to say we're in every market there, there's out there, uh, from the, the federal government to uh, uh, state and municipal uh, governments to uh, colleges, universities, hospitals. Um, so uh, again, very uh, excited to be here and uh, share some background from us. Um, next slide, please. All right, so again, I wanted to keep it uh, educational. Um, people refer to the chargers normally in three different ways, uh, level one, L1, level two, L2, and sometimes level three, but really what's called DC fast charging. The level one and level two is AC uh, charging. The, uh, uh, the DC fast charging is, is DC. Um, so level one, we're not, we're not seeing that many manufacturers making a, a level one uh, charger because it's, it really turns out to be just a trickle charge where you can buy a, an affordable level two charger. And you know our, our standard is now 48 amps. We also have 80 amps for level two. And that's gonna give that car about a driving range of somewhere around 45 miles. I say somewhere because it, there's you know, many variables, one of which is how long the electrical run is. The longer 
the the, the run, you know, the, the, the more uh, degradation. Um, so that that said, you know, th those are uh, approximate numbers. But but level two is um, relative to DC fast charging. We'll get in it later. Just um, very affordable to purchase, very affordable to install. And then there's DC fast charging. And, and that's that very, very fast, that very high power charge. It's 480 volts. Um, and, and depending on the, char the charger, the, the, the kilowatt charger, there's you know, many different ranges from 50 to 350 kilowatt chargers out there. So depending on that charger, uh, the, uh, the, the charge time could be anywhere from uh, 15 minutes to 60 minutes. Um, and it, it depends on the charger and the kilowatt rating, but it also depends on the car and what the car can uh, accept. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the cars are starting to take off, but ironically, um, and, and the prices were, were coming down, um, you know, when the, the price of the, the, the battery uh, capacity uh, gets to about $100 uh, dollars per kilowatt hour, um, that's you know when we're going to see a break even with today's combustion engines. And, and frankly, I, I think we're there. And, and just one example, it's, it's very late you know, breaking news. Um, GM's uh, Bolt, uh, Chevy Bolt, uh, the, the base model is going to come out somewhere around $28,000, uh, somewhere in that area. Uh, I didn't realize this, thankfully, because I haven't had to buy a car recently, but the average uh, new car today is $47,000. And again, the combustion engines clearly dominate the, 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 that number because of the, the the small and growing percentage of electric vehicles. So if the Chevy Bolt's coming out at around twenty eight thousand, and the average uh, uh, car is forty seven, uh, it's starting to get very attractive. Uh, there was an article about Ford also talking about how soon a twenty five thousand dollar vehicle is going to be available. The Tesla has been talking about it as well. Um, with the, the recent supply chain uh, issues. Um, I, I think it's still going to be a few, a few years off where we're at that $25,000 price point. But what, with uh, the, the, Chevy, the announcement of the, the Chevy Bolt um, at that price range, uh, I, I think the uh, attraction of the electric vehicles are going to become even more, not to mention the, 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 the ongoing increased price of gasoline. And the more people drive and own electric vehicles, the more they're going to talk about the instant torque, the performance of these vehicles, how cheap they are to, to maintain, um, and how cheap, frankly, the, the, the price of electricity is. Uh, just to put things in perspective, the, you know, the price for electricity you know, relative to gas um, is about one-fifth the, the price of electricity. So again, the, the, the more people realize the overall uh, life cycle cost of an electric vehicle, um, I think the adoption is going to shoot through the roof. Uh, next slide, please. So, so where are we going to charge? You know, I, I don't even like the word uh, range anxiety. The, the word alone uh, scares me. But, but the fact of the matter is, I've, I've been driving an electric vehicle for about eight or nine years. Um, I cheat a little bit because I drive the Chevy Volt with a V. And that gives you the best of both worlds. I get about 60 miles of electricity for all my local driving. And if I have to go anywhere far, I get 400 miles in, in gasoline. But that said, many times I, I do stay on electricity, even with that small range. And that's, that's the point of, of this whole slide that, you know, look at the base of, of this uh, triangle here. The, the biggest base is at home. Most people who own a, an electric vehicle, I, I say most, I, I realize some condos, uh, maybe some uh, lower uh, socioeconomic uh, apartments, you know, may not be putting in the chargers and they, they can't. But the majority of the owners who do have the electric cars uh, are doing their charging uh, at home. And, and just, you know, think about yourself, your, your, um, your, your typical trip, I think I have it in a, another slide, but, but I think on average, we, we, we all drive less than 100 miles a day. 
many of these new electric cars coming out today easily have a range of over 200 miles. So, you know, the, the road trip is another category in itself, but you have to think about what, what is your driving habits 90% of the time, or maybe even 52 weeks out of the year. But, but anyway, so that said, most of your, your charging's at home. And again, that's why multifamily is one of our targets. One of the next largest categories, you know, really is your, your workplace charging, your stores, your, your restaurants, uh, retail, and that's why workplace charging. You know, last I checked, when I go to work, you know, most of us work at least four to eight hours and our cars normally sit still. So, you know, what does that mean? Your, your workplace charging, if you don't have a charger at home, your, your, your workplace charging um, is an outstanding place to charge. Again, putting things in perspective, uh, putting things in perspective on how long your commute is, most drivers could leave their work fully topped off in, an, in probably in an hour or, or less. So we make these chargers, they're designed to be shared. Um, and, and then uh, at stations along the road, and, and that's for your uh, weekend trips and your vacations. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, you know, this slide, I, you know, I, I really want to just talk about the, the, the type of chargers and, you know, what the fit is and, and, where, and where that charge is going to be. I, again, I got ahead of myself. You, you know, most of the households, 90% uh, of the time, are driving 100 miles or less. Um, you know, unless you're, you're, you're doing a lot of delivery driving, uh, you know, our, our car uh, is only being used 10% of the day. Um, just want to get into just a few differences of, about uh, L2 charging versus DC fast charging. Um, the buyers just have to be very careful and, and understand, you know, what, what their requirements and what their, their needs are. But that said, L, L2 chargers are very easy to install. Um, the, the, it, a lot of the infrastructure is already there versus DC fast chargers. Now, we do both, so I don't have a, a, a bias. But I, I want to make it clear that um, you know the L2 charging uh, can do um, a great percentage of the charging needs out there, other than that that highway, that rest stop type charging. Uh, normally, there's not a, a grid upgrade required for the L2 charging. There's there's even no routine maintenance for a, a level two charger. The DC fast chargers um, has uh, some you know, filters, some air filters that, that do need to, to be replaced. Um, you know, our, our chargers, it, think, think about a light pole. It's just, it's just a pass through of electricity. There, there is no calibrating it. There's no adjustments. It's just an occasional wipe down with, with a mild detergent. So again, with an L2 charger, no routine maintenance. Um, you know, in, in terms of, of the cost, uh, the L2 chargers are about uh, one-tenth the, the price of a, a DC fast charger. The, the installation cost for DC fast chargers is immense. So you really, the buyers really have to understand their needs. And I'm just going to jump into that with these last two items. So a school bus, for example, um, with the rating, with a battery capacity of 220 kilowatt hours, with a, an 80 amp L2 charger, it could be charged in under 12 hours. So assuming it's dr working 12 hours, and I don't think it is, I, I, I think it's less, maybe like an eight hour time frame. Anyway, there's ample time for overnight charging. And so the, the level two charger can be a, a, a good option there. And that allows all of our grant money, our federal money to go further if the buyers understand the requirements and makes the, the correct and most efficient purchase. Um, an, another example is a, which is gonna be popular for uh, transit, for deliveries for fleet, is the Ford E-Transit. Um, that 68 kilowatt hour Ford E-Transit could be totally charged in four hours or less. So uh, again, for that, you know, depending on the shifts and how long those vehicles are, are being charged, you really want to understand what your kilowatt capacity is and, and what, um, you know, an L2 charger could do for you. Next slide. Uh, so, so industry uh, game changers, policies, uh, issues, uh, support EV charging and building codes for new uh, construction. Um, 
I, I think that one's huge. And where I'm going with this is many new properties, many uh, municipalities, regulation is saying, you know, you need to put in X amount of EV chargers up front and X percentage make ready. I've seen somewhere around like 5% is a, a common number uh, for EV ready and up to 25% for um, make ready. Make ready is the amount of infrastructure in place that all you have to do is, is mount. I, I think that's, that's a great one because doing a retrofit is then that much more uh, expensive. Um, federal and state incentives, I'll, I'll say many years, the Catherine mentioned it, the alternative fueling infrastructure tax credit. Um, I, I think that's a, a great one. Many times the electrical infrastructure cost to do the installation is more expensive than the chargers themselves. And I know many commercial customers would be constantly asking about that uh, tax credit and you know, really uh, uh, almost became reliant on that. Uh, but that said, those are some good ones. And then the state programs, um, you know, being in the mid-Atlantic, I'm referencing Maryland, they've had a very good solid rebate program, 40% based on uh, total costs, very simple program. The, and I, I've seen many that are, are, the overview alone is uh, like over 20 pages. Now I'm seeing them around eight to four pages, very easy to understand. There's really not a, a lot there and some, some great um, uh, state uh, programs out there. And I, and I think those are going to go a long way. And then as Catherine went, talked about the, the equitable uh, access, um, you know, going to be very important going forward. Next slide. And that's it. I hope I, I stayed on time and looking forward to uh, talking to everybody a little later. Thanks again. Thanks, Joe. And regular viewers of the ESI webcasts know that I love nothing more than building energy code. So I appreciate that shout out. It's a really, really important thing. And it's crazy that we're building new construction that are not, that is not EV ready. Um, our third, uh, actually, before I introduce our third panelist, let me, two reminders. One, uh, slides, presentation materials, archived webcast. If you'd like to go back and revisit anything, it's all available online at www.eesi.org. Um, also, we're covering a lot of really interesting topics, and I expect that people in our audience today uh, have questions. And if you do have questions, you have two options to ask them. Uh, one is to send us an email, ask uh, at eesi.org. That's A-S-K at eesi.org. Or if you uh, would, would like to, you can also follow us on Twitter at EESI online and uh, uh, ask us a question that way. Um, we would appreciate the follow, of course, but also even more so appreciate the question to help um, um, advance the discussion today. Our third speaker is Yvette Ellis. Yvette is the Chief Workforce Officer and co-founder of Charger Help. Charger Help's app-based dispatch and deployment system solves the industry-wide problem of broken electric vehicle charging stations by providing on-demand repairs and maintenance support from trained local workforces. With over 15 years of experience as an impactful and thought-provoking workforce developer, Yvette has championed businesses and empowering decision makers to develop opportunities that create equitable and prolonged change through the lens of workforce development. Yvette, it's a pleasure to see you today. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thanks so much. Good morning. Thank you so much, Stan, for that introduction. <clears throat> Hope everybody out there is doing well. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. Okay. Let's get going. Who is Charger Help? Dan told you briefly who we are. Technology solutions for EV charging maintenance and workforce enablement um, to set the standard. What we want to do is to set the standard for servicing for EV charging infrastructure um, using technology powered solutions. We service level two DC um, FC for passenger light, medium, and heavy duty vehicles. So that's who we are in a snapshot. Next slide, please. Okay, here's a little snapshot of our team, some of our techs from last year, um, but just want to introduce you to my co-founder, Camille, our Chief Revenue Officer, Jamie, and our Head of Product, um, uh, Walter, and with the entire team, we have Government Relations, and we have a tech team in 11 states, um, our actual EVSE technicians who go out boots on the ground and fix the broken EV charging stations. Next slide. All right. I um, thought we would level set, so give us some street credibility. <laughs> These are some of our customers. 
Um, so we're really, really, really uh, closely working with manufacturers, network providers, utilities um, to make sure that the not only the legacy machines that are in the ground now, but also this new coming um, um, the new coming assets that are being put in the ground now that they are up and working as well. Uh, next slide, please. So today we're going to get into a little bit of two things. We're going to get into, I set my timer and still didn't push it. <laughs> we're going to get into two things. We're going to get into a little bit of reliability and how it relates directly uh, to the workforce development part of our industry. So right now where we are, um, you have 500 billion plus dollars being invested into EVs. Um, that rely on the current EV charging infrastructure. Um, and some of these pictures here are some real pictures that our technicians um, have shared with us. You know, the one at the bottom here, there's a wasp nest. Uh, you see a connector cut. And then you see here the out of order sign. These are all live and, and uh, the public are directed to these um, charging stations. And as you can see, they're down. And this problem actually is a bigger problem that I think we are taking seriously. Um, as we build this infrastructure, there'll be things in place uh, for 97% uptime, there'll be things in place to ensure that the, the incoming um, charging stations have operations and maintenance, which it's that's what Charter Hub does. We do operations and maintenance. We do not install. Um, but it's very important that we get a snapshot of where the current infrastructure is right now. All right, next slide. Okay, um, so a few things, <coughs> excuse me, about Charter Hub that we do. Um, we ensure charging station reliability and technology enable inclusive green economy workforce. So that's where I come in as chief workforce officer. Um, and as you can see here, some of these things are what our technicians do. We do do technician um, training. We do field service deployment, parts and logistics management, reliability management. Um, we optimize and the EVSC diagnostics. It's a really, really big deal um, that we understand not only to put the machines in the ground, but to keep them up and working. We'll take, yes, technology, but also field service. Also, we have to have people that can go solve the problem immediately. Um, I love the idea of when you think of Google Maps and where Google Maps was maybe 10, 12 years ago. If you remember people driving around taking pictures <laughs> and then when you put in it, and put in an address, you see this picture, and now where Google Maps is now, you know, you can pretty much get a street view and turn the camera around and see the whole nine. So really that's to me where we are in this um, industry. We have to actually touch the machines, go fix them. We have to figure out analytically what is the problem, what's going down to make sure that the, the infrastructure stays up and running as we put new things down in the ground. Um, new things, new charging stations down in the ground. Next slide, please. All right, so here's a little bit about how we use technology to enable our workforce. This is a snapshot of our platform. And as you can see, we work with charging station owners, network operators, um, OEMs, EV OEMs, um, uh, utilities, and funding programs. Um, and we have our own charger help. Uh, technicians, and we also are exploring what it looks like to have subcontracted technicians as well, because what you will see a lot of is a lot of uh, crossover. You will see a lot of um, cross training, up training, not just the initial training. And one thing we talk about when we talk about uh, workforce development is not adopting the idea that everything has to be a brand new workforce. A lot of these skill sets can be taught, can become transferable skills. And so as uh, different folks in the ecosystem adopt the idea of cross-training and up-training, we'll be able to not only create new jobs, but also extend jobs of those who are currently maybe not working in the green space. Next slide, please. All right, so we have the right workforce for the problem. So one thing that we did when we started Charter Help, because of my career history with workforce development, uh, working with the Department of Labor, I knew that an O-NET code was really, really important. And the O-NET code is 
the uh, the ONET database. It's a database that Department of Labor uses to determine everything from the legitimacy of the the job. What what are you paid? What are the skill sets? Um, what training? What are the um, duties that you're doing on a regular basis? So I knew it was really important with our effort to be equitable, um, diverse, to, to be inclusive. Um, I knew it was really, really important that we worked with the Department of Labor, Labor to ensure that they had a pulse on what we were doing and they approved us um, for our ONET code. So that's our ONET code there. And while we're placed in the electrical and electronics repairs, uh, <laughs> what we do is we're not electricians, nor are we trying to be our techs are really, really good at knowing where to stop and escalate. Uh, but we are big on safety. And I call us like the geek squad for um, EV charging. So we work directly with the manufacturers and the network providers to get the charging machine up and running again. So it was important that the, the Department of Labor was aware of what we were doing, and they assigned us this code here that you see in front of you. Um, also, information technology technicians uh, with relevant safety certifications. So these are the type of folks that we're looking for. The safety certifications that we are just are just deal breakers, non-starters. Um, we require the NFPA 70E from the National Fire Association. We require OSHA trainings. We have a uh, high voltage training, and we also have tiered techs at Charger Help. So everybody doesn't start off on the same level. And this is a way that, as far as workforce development is concerned, that you can really, really empower the workforce. Some folks will be brand new, and some people can move up. And it also creates um, pathways, um, uh, growth, uh, mobility options. So when we use the tiered section, it allows people into the space to actually become a part of the union. A nice percentage of our um, technicians, our current technicians, come from gas and oil, mainly because they are excellent when it comes to safety, right? They have a different ear and a different brain when it comes to safety, which is what we wanted. We have people from closing factories um, that worked on machinery. We also have technicians who are veterans, um, and then lastly, we have those that, that come in from telecommunications that install internet or cable before, um, fiber optics that were very, very helpful um, as we started building Charger Help. We also are working with um, community colleges, those who may be in automotive programs, electrical programs, um, IT programs, they are all very marketable and attractive to us as well. Next slide. Okay, so here we're going to talk about equitable jobs for all because I think we want equity, um, inclusion, diversity to be more than a buzzword, I'm sure. Um, but one way that we were able to do that was that we partnered with workforce development centers, agencies, programs. We partnered with community college to source, to recruit our um, our applicants and to grow our training pipeline. We worked with them, A, because uh, it, you will find a little bit more of everyone in those spaces. It's also a space where federal money is already being poured into, and they have whole departments up and running to be able to meet the need of employers. So it's a great place that this is what they're geared to do, is working with the local workforce development programs and community college. We worked really hard to offer $30 an hour. I think money is a big deal when you're talking about um, <clears throat> when you're talking about working with um, when you're working with workforce development centers, programs, agencies, community colleges. Sometimes we don't pay attention to what we start people off. And, and because this will be a lucrative industry, we really did a lot of research about what is equitable pay for this position. We looked at other similar positions and we decided $30 an hour. So all of our techs start off at $30 an hour, which makes this a very competitive job. Uh, we were hiring for, I think, 20 technicians, and we had over 1,600 applicants from all over the country. So people are really interested in being paid decently um, and being paid well. And then the last thing is uh, our certified EBSE maintenance technician, um, of course, nationally recognized with Department of Labor's um, ONET code, but also um, we have worked with national um, certification programs like OSHA and NFPA uh, 
uh, to make sure that our technicians have equivalent um, safety training. We do safety training on a regular basis. Weekly here at Charger Help, we have a safety and compliance officer. Um, and that leads me uh, to the next slide, please. Okay, in the next slide, would I want you to notice that we secure work, we train and hire, we do stackable certifications, and then we utilize technology to keep our technicians up and running. But I'm, I wanted to run through that because the best thing that I want you all to take away from this is that when we talk about really exploring the workforce for this industry, they all won't be EVSE technicians, um, electric vehicle supply equipment technicians. We have seen a growth in sales, project management. Um, there's a number of other positions that will be closely and directly related to this industry growing. So um, I often encourage folks when you're thinking about the workforce, I say, uh, are you a very plain lens? Any, any positions that you need in any other industry, you will also need um, in the EV industry as well. So we, it's not just the EVSC technician, but also logistics, management, operations, all of those positions now become um, very important to really get this off the ground and for mass EV adoption to happen. Next slide, please. And I think I have a two minute warning, great. Okay, just wanted to, uh, a little history on kind of um, how we do things. We were founded in 2020 and started off with, with two customers. Then in 2021, we moved to a utility and that area is growing as well. And then now into the future, um, we have introduced Charger Help as a service, what we call it reliability as a service. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so yeah, reliability, I just wanted to make sure I got through all of them. Reliability as a service um, is pretty much a warranty that you can get coverage on your charging stations. And this not only does uh, this, yes, protects your charging station and make sure you can get it fixed, but also this is another way that we can grow the workforce when we commit to having our infrastructure online um, and ready to go and having trained professionals out that can keep it um, online and fixed. Um, not only does it make our infrastructure work, but it also opens up jobs and more skills for people currently in jobs. So really excited to share with you all. Thank you so much for your time and thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Yvette, it was our pleasure. Um, awesome presentation and congratulations on doing so well in such a short period of time. That's pretty impressive. Thank you, we're working hard, thank you. We're working hard. Um, our fourth panelist today uh, is uh, Laura Getz. Laura is the business development manager for the San Isabel Electric Association. Uh, and there she works with local and regional stakeholders to further equitable electrification and economic development in Southern Colorado. Laura also serves on Colorado's Low Income Energy and Water Assistance Legislative Commission. And she formerly served as the energy coordination uh, coordinator for uh, Pueblo County. Laura, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say about how things are going out in Colorado. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me today. So I am excited to present everyone with the Rural Electric Cooperative perspective on EV infrastructure build out. So of course I cannot speak for all rural co-ops, but I think that many of our experiences resonate nationwide. Uh, to give you a sense of our environment, our not-for-profit electric co-op is located in Southern Colorado, and we serve approximately 21,000 voting members. About 35% of our membership lives in a more urbanized environment, while the other 65% are in rural areas as defined by the USDA. So the three primary counties that we serve are some of the poorest in Colorado and often represent the top three highest unemployment rates in the state month over month. The federal government has recently released maps highlighting disadvantaged and distressed communities across the nation. And as you can see, a fairly large swath of our territory is considered disadvantaged for this criteria. So to date, there are a total of 11 charging stations across our service territory, um, and we own about 60% of those. Uh, to date, we've tested out about three different station brands. Um, and while we have put in a mix of level two and fast chargers, 
we see that private investment um, in our territory has been trending towards DC fast chargers. Future installations and opportunities for charging are likely to be associated with our state parks um, along our scenic highways and byways and in partnership with local government um, and in working with our rural transit, transit agencies to electrify their fleets. We do have low adoption in our rural areas relative to our more urbanized populations. So you'll see about 0.03% in our most disadvantaged communities versus 2% in our metro district. This also represents a significant opportunity for growth, however. Uh, something we've also been paying careful attention to is how we serve those passing through our region along significant um, interstate corridors like I-25 here um, and those state highways with higher traffic counts. To date, all of our stations uh, have been funded in part by state grants and some additional money from our generation and transmission provider, Tri-State. State funding has been very important to us um, and it covers about 50% of the total cost of, uh, between purchase and installation of these units. Um, we have on occasion also pursued community funding partnerships to make some of these um, more significant investments with DC fast chargers possible. Uh, although there's a there's a longer lead time kind of in gathering those partners and funding and, and working out the agreements between the partners. Uh, we have also developed a residential EV charging program for our membership with the understanding that up to 90% of EV charging is likely to take place at residences. Our program provides a free level two charger with proof of EV ownership and an agreement um, that the member will allow us to manage their charging to a certain extent by restricting their charging during our peak energy usage times. Our cooperative also received five, five million in 0% interest funding through the Rural Energy Savings Program or RESP. And we use this federal money to offer low interest on bill financing for our members. The money helps cover the cost of installation and electrical upgrades that can often be associated with these residential installs. We also offer rebates on top of that to help mitigate the installation cost. So we have developed a robust energy services program called Empower, and this serves as a one-stop shop for the assessment, installation, and financing of things that our members might want, like solar, water heating, insulation, and EV charging installations. Because um, like solar, EV charging is considered a lot sexier than many of the other in-home opportunities to tackle energy efficiency. Um, so we use it as a gateway tool to work with our members on a whole host of comprehensive um, energy related upgrades for their lives. We also partner with a trusted local solar provider to help sell and install these charging units um, as this installer has the ground team and the electricians that are needed to get these things accomplished really at scale successful so far in less than two years, we've already booked more than a million dollars in on-bill energy related loans just in our membership alone. So um, some things for us to consider opportunities with regard to EV infrastructure, transportation electrification um, certainly brings opportunities like load growth, which might be 18% or more for our cooperative. Um, and then importantly, opportunities for load management um, so that we can see these as an asset versus uh, a challenge at the end of the day, um, and really opportunities to encourage charging at times that support our grid. There's also a unique chance to bring economic development into rural America as chargers located at small rural businesses encourage drivers to get off the highway and spend their money in our rural communities. Um, and finally, member engagement for us is is a critical part of our strategy map. Um, and the me member engagement piece naturally results from managed charging as these programs require us to be in regular communication with our members and help them see themselves as partners in the optimization of our grid. And just a few considerations um, as we work through charging infrastructure. Um, one big thing in general is the affordability of locating infrastructure in pockets of the country with limited electrical capacity. Anytime we have to go in and upgrade a transformer or run a line longer distances, it can come with really substantial costs. 
it often causes us to work backwards, um, you know, and, and maybe we have partners interested in charging. So we'll bring in a map and say, okay, you know, where can we affordably build out infrastructure in locations and start circling spots on a map with our system engineer um, to really show where it financially makes sense to do so. For peak costs, if charging ever happens to coincide with our monthly peak, a single fast charging station could cost us between two and $5,000 in a month. Um, so this is where managed charging will be critical. Um, and although our peak can often be a moving target, uh, real-time management of these stations will, could be a big future consideration. Payback is also difficult in rural America. Um, payback for all of our stations right now, even in the more urbanized areas, is still more than 20 years. So that's why grants have been and will continue to be a very important consideration for us. Um, and then coordinated coordination and communication is critical. We don't necessarily want to be the ones who have to in install all of this infrastructure. We're taking the lead because we know it needs to happen. Um, but if you know a local business or the state even wants to do so, we think that's fantastic. We just need to know that it's going to happen. Um, you know, and if we encourage a, a business to move forward, we also want to know what might be happening at the state level because more than one station um, in a specific pocket of the territory at this time could really hurt someone's return on investment. So it's important to know well in advance um, what our map is going to look like. Equity is critically important. In some pockets of our territory, 10% of households don't even have access to a vehicle. So we want to be mindful of how we allocate our cooperative funds when we're putting them into infrastructure. So I've recently spent a lot of time working with our rural transit agencies on electrification plans for their fleet and what that fleet would need um, as they serve a large percentage of our disadvantaged populations. And then finally, maintenance and software subscriptions have increasingly become an important consideration. Subscription and maintenance plan costs to manage these stations, track data, charge fees, and just generally keep them online can cost several thousand dollars a year, sometimes per station. And it's a growing budget line item for us. Um, it also makes many of our small businesses hesitate to invest in infrastructure um, because of that uh, consistent cost they will have to bear each year. Um, and it's a, it's a big thing to consider when they're unlikely to see an ROI in the more immediate future. So thank you again for the opportunity uh, to present with you this afternoon. Don't hesitate to reach out um, at any point if you want to continue the conversation. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. Um, let us bring all of our panelists um, back online and we will um, uh, commence with our questions and answers. Um, and uh, look, really, really looking forward to this discussion. Four really great presentations um, that helped um, sort of define what this looks like and where it's going and how it ought to be done properly. So really looking forward to this. Um, the first question I would like to ask is, um, uh, we have a big country and it's geographically diverse. A lot of it's urban, but an awful lot of it is not urban, it's rural, it's suburban. And I'm considering for a federal policy audience that's thinking about federal policies and what can be done, what the federal government can do, what are some of the considerations that policymakers should consider to ensure that charging infrastructure is convenient and reliable for consumers in rural areas, suburban areas, and urban areas? And are there things the federal government could be doing that maybe makes it easier for states and, and even regional organizations or for localities to do this. And Catherine, maybe we'll start with you. We haven't heard from you for a while and then we'll go through the order. Um, I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts about um, how we should be how we should be thinking about these considerations. Yep, absolutely. And I live in a, I consider it to be a rural, it's a hundred miles outside of Phoenix. And so I think first of all, it's important for um, just that recognition that the driving patterns are different between rural communities and urban ones and rural communities not everybody has a garage, but you have more than likely more um, places where you can have access to a charging um, at home station, whereas in more urban settings, there's a lot more apartments, um, other types of multi unit dwellings, and so you might not have that access. And so that's really important to consider in any type of um, federal planning or just city state planning. Um, with the federal funding, though, I mean, that 2.5 billion in the competitive 
grants um, that we're still waiting on the guidance for, but that does then include uh, specific set aside for communities and for rural communities. So that's going to help to really establish um, um, getting some more rural communities on board and showing them that this technology works, getting those best practices, lessons learned, adopted. I do think that um, I mentioned in my presentation that HR 6390, the um, allowing for the EV infrastructure to be on American farms, that that's going to help a lot too, um, because we're electrifying not just our personal vehicles, which we always, that's usually what I, I think about first, but also all forms of transportation here. So the tractors and other farm equipment. And so the more that we can um, bring that technology to the forefront of rural communities, that's going to help further drive adoption too. So I could go on, but I'll let others answer if you want them to. Thanks. Joe, how does this look like from your perspective as someone who makes these chargers to be installed in different areas, different types of buildings? Uh, certainly the, the rural uh, com community is a little more challenged because let's face it, the, the vehicles do have a, a limited uh, range. Um, and, you know, so, so that said, it would put the requirement for uh, the, the, you know, the faster chargers to help get them from point A to, to point B. Um, you know, I, I personally think that it, in the big picture, we're only 10 years into this in terms of the, the vehicles uh, alone. The combustion engine has been around over a hundred years. So I think the improvements, the R&D is going to be uh, within the nanotechnology of the battery itself, the sm smaller the battery could be, the longer the range is. Um, and over time, it, the problem should work itself out. But in agreement, I, I've we've talked to many rural communities, rural locations, and because of their commutes are longer, it, it, it is, a, uh, it is gonna be a, a challenge. And, and really nothing more to add than what Catherine uh, said. Yvette, please feel free to jump in and then we'll hear from Well, with a workforce development lens, <clears throat> I think we can't just only plant charging stations. I think we have to think about jobs for these same rural com communities. They have to also be a part of <laughs> the infrastructure. So um, I, I think job training being attached to it where we can find actual well-paying jobs within those communities. I know for charter help, sometimes if we have a charter, charging station in the middle of Montana, I'm like, you know, it's sometimes hard to get someone there versus if, you know, we can train in that area. So a, a lot of forecasting um, to your, your workforce development folks, it's very helpful for people to know what kind of jobs are coming, what kind of, what kind of technology is coming to their communities. And now can you tell me what kind of jobs are connected to the technology? We just can't bring in technology and everybody on the coast and everybody in big metropolitan cities get the, the great jobs, right? We Jobs are remote. It's ways for everyone to be a part of this. So I definitely say um, for rural communities showing that not only is technology coming and need to be accessible, but also the jobs that are related to it. Great, and I would just add, um, I think we're seeing a lot more excitement in our rural communities around um, the number of trucks coming onto the market. That's, that has people perking up a little bit and showing more interest um, in electrified transportation. Um, but I would, I see a lot of opportunity for smaller rural businesses and communities to benefit from the ownership of these stations. And so certainly it's important to be building out our big networks running through rural America, but to any extent that we can bring the funding to these communities um, and not necessarily just the companies who will build the infrastructure in the communities, but allow our business owners to own and manage and run these stations. Um, you know, and, and get them set up initially in an affordable way um, so that they can see benefit once there is more mass adoption on the market. I, that can come with a big win for our communities as well. Great. Thank you so much. So we've gotten a couple questions from the audience and one, I'm not sure exactly who might be interested in answering this, so I will put it up as a grab bag, uh, but it's a good one. And it's, um, the, the questioner is thinking of wind and solar energy deployment and how those resources are becoming increasingly common on our grid, especially in certain parts of the country that are 
you know, quickly displacing fossil fuels and how those resources are more or less available during a typical day just because of the profile of those resources. How should our strategy for charging infrastructure take advantage of renewable energy when it is most available and cheapest? And again, I'll let anyone weigh in on that. I think it's a really interesting question. Well, I'm happy to jump in. So first of all, um, yeah, I, I love it that wind and solar is becoming, I used to work for the Solar Industry Association, so big solar supporter here. But I think that um, it's great that more of that is coming on board and that does then just all the more reason why utilities have to be at the table when we're talking about infrastructure too, because they know the load profiles, they know when they're more likely to see a peak demand. And we know that over time, that's that used to be at like the one o'clock, two o'clock time. Now that's shifted to six, seven, eight p.m. So they're aware of these trends. And so they'll know also, I mean, with wind and solar profiles, um, do they need to have um, at some charging locations that are more high usage, you, you know, seeing more drivers come up and pull to take advantage of this? Maybe they need to have a storage bank there or something. Um, so yeah, let's get the utilities involved. Um, Laura, I'm sure you're shaking your head yes. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I think that's where managed charging is very important and you see it changing as we have more solar adoption. So right now, you know, the push is to get people to charge overnight. That's when power is going to be cheapest um, and that's going to avoid our peak. But as we see more solar online, you know, if there's excess solar on the grid, we're going to want to encourage people to be charging midday when that asset um, is available and that can kind of help um manage some of the duck curve issues we the reverse duck curve you start to see um, in some parts of the country well thank you for that that's a really great uh set of answers and um i'll take a second just to plug um we covered uh this topic from a couple different perspectives last summer as part of our uh, infrastructure uh, series or modernizing the energy system series and our june 25th briefing perhaps our social media team um, could uh, retweet a link uh, to the briefing, but we had um, and that was part of our leveraging grid edge integration for resilience and decarbonization. We had a speaker sort of specifically talking about how charging behavior can be influenced by the availability of these resources. So when I'm looking off to this direction, that's because I'm trying to get my dates right and make sure I say the right briefing. I have multiple monitors, so I'm not that. That's the excuse. We actually just got another really important question, I think a really interesting question from the audience. And this one comes to us from Capitol Hill. Again, I'll open this up for anyone who wants to answer it. But the question is, what model was used to build out the national network of gas stations? And how applicable is that model to building out EV infrastructure? Is there any lessons learned from how well that went or how well it didn't go that we might want to play, you know, um, pay forward for how we build out electric vehicle charging? I will say this. I, I don't know the model exactly, but we, we do work with the Fuels Institute and um, some folks in the oil industry, um, and they are not the enemy. They actually have been very helpful with sharing information. So I always like to share that. But one thing that that blew some some folks mind is with charging like required lighting you know is it in a safe space like those basic things when you go to a gas station normally is it near a restroom like you know when you think of families pulling over to refuel if we're looking at um charging as a new fueling source right so it needs to come with the whole thing so the safety of it all um i think is one of the models that we have to start looking at. I know we kind of see it in a very uh, silo, just the charging station, and we're just putting it in the ground. But really, when you think about mass EV adoption and everyone using it, what does it look like for a mom with kids in a car to pull over and charge and use public charging? Is it safe? Is it clean? We do a lot of preventative maintenance at Charger Health to go out and make sure that the charging stations that are out there are actually working. So I would say the safety part of it is something that we probably could take a look at in the surrounding areas. Um, when we talk about EV charging, it's probably something that we can take from the gas and oil industry. That's a great point, a totally great point. And um, yeah, just having charging stations out in the middle of nowhere <laughs> without all those other amenities, um, it's a great point. Um, 
I have a question, and Joe, maybe we'll start with you this time and then we'll go through the, the rest of the, the panel in order to hear what others have to say. Um, but this one's about public-private partnerships. And I'm curious what you see as opportunities for the private sector and the public sector, um, and maybe the nonprofit sector, but the private sector and the public sector to work together to build out uh, and bolster EV charging infrastructure beyond what's already happening. Sure. Um, and Dan, I, I alluded to it earlier, the, the, the two different sources, the two different uh, programs that we were constantly, you know, working with, and one is that that 30% uh, alternative fueling infrastructure tax credit. Um, it, it's it, it has been available almost every year, and then one year, and then like two years, like maybe 2019, 2020, it wasn't available, and then 2021, it was available, and it even said, oh, for anybody who did the installations of the last you know, two years when they didn't have it, you could, you could now apply these costs. Well, many people made decisions, maybe not because the credit wasn't there. So, you know, my, my big ask from the, the, the policy side is, you know, if you're gonna make it available, make it available in the, the beginning of the year, the, the retro um, availability, you know, only does so much, but, but that said, our, our private customers, they were making decisions. The, the, it almost seemed like the urgency was there and they were taking advantage, knowing that the, the alternative fueling infrastructure tax credit may or may not be renewed. So that, that and, and in, in terms of our contribution, we are educating our, our customers on that. Um, and then over the years, you know, not all states had a program, many, many do now, but, but again, we're their biggest cheerleaders. We're gonna we're gonna market it and 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 pitch in and and help. Um, and all I would say is, the more concise that program is, the, the easier to understand. Um, the, the more active it's going to be. And it's usually the goal of that state to use all that funding. And again, Maryland is my backyard. Maryland had a very successful program where to to get the money, it was show a picture of the install, fill out a two page rebate and show the invoices of the total costs. If you could imagine that's, it's then easy to administer for the, the state program and it's easy for the, the customers. And, you know, frankly, having a large sales force, it's the more, the easier that program is, the easier we're gonna get that word out for them. Other comments across the panel about potential for additional public private mute, partnerships? Oops, am I? You're back. Okay, good. I, um, sorry, sorry about that. Any other comments from across the panel about potential for public private partnerships? Yeah, I just add in here that about with the NEVI funding too, I mean, there, there's a requirement of the 20% cost share um, with, this, with the state plans. And so we're looking forward to seeing how states are gonna be addressing that. And then the companies, how they're looking to partner with states and just, you know, as as who was saying that this we're 10 years into this market in so we're, we're just at the cusp of some really creative innovative ideas here. Um, so I'm looking forward to the innovation that's coming from from the Nevi funds. I'd also just a comment going back to the question about the gas stations and the network there. Sorry to jump back to that. But I just I think it's important to keep in mind that it's so different with electric technologies. I mean, let's even just think about the medium and heavy duty sector that in the past, if you're driving a big semi, you're going to have to go to the central fueling to the gas station and fuel up there but now if you are a fedex or an amazon or whatever you can you have already that electric infrastructure at your facility and so you have your own hub where you can charge from and so it's it's really different um there are some things like yvette was saying i think the apples to apples in terms of the safety the lighting wasn't like things like that for sure but it really is um it's a whole nother way of doing transportation i would say uh, i would say with the intersectionality of private and public and even nonprofit, I think we share different information and different lenses. We work with different groups of folks. So I would say fully understanding like what's at stake when it comes to operations and maintenance and the workforce, like what, what really are we working with? What kind of pipeline is really available? Because I think in the private world, you know, where maybe a lot more money is available, decisions are just being made. And I think in the public world, we may have a lens on the workforce and other things that might not 
always be <laughs> added into the equation. So I think that's important. Also limiting systemic barriers, understanding what kind of things we are maybe not even thinking of that we can put in place that will really limit a community to, uh, you know, to take advantage of EV charging and the benefits of it. So I definitely think working with some public and nonprofit organizations will help give private sectors and vice versa. You, you know what I'm saying? The information you need. And I think private sector really is good with telling us like, look, this is the bottom line. And then these other areas actually understand how it works and there's no assumptions there. So I think a lot of um, education, catching barriers, those are the places where we can intersect and really help move EV mass adoption. Thanks for that. That's really interesting. Um, another question, uh, maybe a more of a clarifying question from the audience, and this has to do with compatibility. Are there any issues with how different makes and models are charged that would have to be addressed as we build out an EV charger network? Are certain, are certain, are certain brands, do they have different requirements or are we moving towards something where, uh, you know, a situation where every, every electric vehicle can basically be plugged by, you know, every available charger? I don't know. Uh, Joe, Yvette, you might have sort of technical thoughts about that. And Yvette, I'd be very interested in, if that's the case, how you would train workforces to to be able to, you know, sort of um, take care of both types of uh, EVSE. Sure, Dan, I, I, I could kick that off. So for, for the AC chargers, the Society of Automotive Engineers did agree to one standard, and that's called the, the J1772. Um, Tesla is playing by their own rules and, you know, for, for the reasons um, of their infrastructure. But that said, they also provide their drivers with an adapter that then allows them to use the, the J1772. So that's that's working out well. Um, and there's talk that Tesla will, you know, share with um, all the non-Tesla made cars. So that's still kind of uh, to be seen. In terms of the cars that are made for North America, there, there is now two plugs out there, but that problem is kind of working itself out. One is the CCS1, which is more, uh, more, more common. There's a, a second one called uh, the Ackerman is Chatamo, and that's, I believe, just a couple of the Asian manufacturers, and you know that's slightly changing. You know, to your point, to your question, having everybody ag agreeing to one standard like they did for the AC charging, I, I, I think we're going to be there soon. Um, it, it would make it less complicated. It would make less options with the, the manufacturing process, the, the, the stocking um, and the overall build. And again, it's all about efficiency um, and with greater efficiency of everybody standardizing, it should bring down the costs of the chargers. Yeah, I was going to say, I think we're moving towards standardization. I mean, that, that's such a layered question. <laughs> I think I think that would that is ideal and that is the goal. Um, <clears throat> I, I do, however, as far as like, yes, right now we do have different kind of charging stations, different trainings, and it is a bit fragmented, which is what makes our technicians very attractive to people because we are trained in most of your software providers, your um, your manufacturers, our technicians have over 15 to 20 certifications individually, right? <laughs> From them to have permission to, to work on their assets. So that is a that's a that's a hard push. So I am also hoping that standardization comes, right? And uh, we can like move this in bigger chunks a lot quicker. But Charger Health has has done the groundwork with getting folks trained that can pretty much walk up to any charging machine and, and fix it, so. Great, thanks for that. Go ahead, Laura, please. Sure, I'll just jump in from the utility perspective. We also see the writing on the wall um, with the CCS. And so we got permission from the state with our latest charger that we're installing. Um, it, it does simultaneous charging, but to have it be two CCS plugs instead of one of each. Um, and in terms of different brands of stations, we, we've been trying out a few different brands um, and we, you know, we're testing out software to see which makes the most sense for us um, in terms of reliability um, and access to data. 
but it does come, the subscription piece, the so everything comes with its own software costs. And so, you know, it can be more affordable for us moving forward to, to choose one brand and kind of stick to that. Um, but at the same time, we'd also be beholden to that company um, and whatever they decide to do with their subscription costs at the end of the day. So that's been a consideration for us. Thanks, that's interesting. Um, so this brings us to our final question because we're almost at time. Um, and I'm going to, uh, Catherine, maybe we'll start with you and we'll just go through the order. Um, we'll treat this as a lightning round. So maybe one or two things, uh, it'd be great to get sort of different perspectives and bonus points if you don't repeat what the per previous person said. So that gets harder for Yvette and Laura, but relatively easy for Catherine and Joe. Um, what should, 10 years from now look like in terms of EV charger build out if we do this the right way. Um, what, what's, the, what's your vision for the EV charging infrastructure in 2032? Okay, so in 2032, um, we've got that you can get from point A to point B and not have to, not have to worry that you can't stop and get a charge. Um, and then beyond that, then we have further build out at some of the places where it's um, there's high usage. So maybe that's in cities, maybe that's, um, uh, yeah, just where, where the, the high usage spots, those have been identified. And then we've got additional banks of chargers and that's kind of what Tesla's done. So following their, their lead. Joe? <laughs> she took my answer, no. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what to add. Uh, you know, other than that, you know, we're we're talking to the convenience stores. Um, many of them are interested, uh, and and it's you know it's public information, just uh, um, and, and not directly through us, but uh, Conoco uh, and Philips uh, 66 just had a, an announcement yesterday. Shell has made some announcements, and then some of just the independent convenience stores themselves. And again, we just have to keep in mind you know, the majority of your charging is not going to be, you know, away from your, your, your home. Uh, you know, my belief, again, it's, it's going to be your home. It's going to be your workplace. But that said, the, the, the convenience stores, gas stations, those highway rest stops, just like Catherine said, where you see the Teslas, there should be a, a bunch that's open to everybody and not that the Tesla drivers. And that's, you know, usually state or, or county property. So if they could let Tesla do it, um, I really see those filling out uh, very in, in the near term future, you know, really optimistic that the word range anxiety is going to go away. Yvette, from your perspective, 2032, what does it look like? On and am on every charging asset, right? Like requirements, standards, the whole nine, um, kind of like car insurance, like if this infrastructure is going to go. <clears throat> you can use our RADS, our reliability as a service subscription, uh, and then let next is jobs, you know? Um, how can we really push towards that equitable, inclusive, diverse workforce that we all said we wanted in 2020 and here's a grand opportunity for us to just like open up the gates and allow folks to not only have access to charging, but, but access to the jobs that are supporting this infrastructure, which it's a lot of money, a lot of well-paying jobs to make making sure that we're hitting those those goals as well of being inclusive um, in that area um, of pushing out the technology. Thanks. Laura, you get the last word. What does San Isabel service territory look like 10 years from now in terms of EV charging? Sure. For us, I think it's going to be a matter of not having to go out of your way to charge. So if you were taking a trip or you were going to go to that restaurant anyway, you're not going to think twice. They're going to have a charging facility for you. If you're going to go get groceries, it's just natural. You're going to be hooking up while you go get groceries. Um, you know, if you've a pretty standard place to work, um, you can expect charging facilities at your place of work. And it's you're you're not going to be mapping out a route based on charging facilities. You expect that they're there. Well, thanks for that. That's a great last word to end on. And Catherine, Joe, Yvette, and Laura, thanks for being incredible panelists for us today and helping me, helping ESI, helping our audience understand sort of the, the challenge before us with EV charger build out and um, what the opportunities are as well and where all of these you know, public-private partnerships, cost trends, all of, all of these factors will come into play. Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to live up to the, your visions of 2032. So thanks so much for being 
excellent panelists. Um, I would also like to take a moment to thank my colleagues at EESI, uh, Dan O'Brien, Omri, Emma, Allison, Anna, and Savannah for all of their hard work putting the session together today. It's a lot of work and um, they do all of it. <laughs> um, I do very little of it, um, but these, this is such a great panel and thanks so much to everyone who made a contribution on EESI side. We also have three of our four summer interns already with us, Christina, Stephanie, and Abby. Thanks so much for helping us behind the scenes with live tweeting and briefing notes and all of that stuff too. So thanks very much. Um, we, uh, my colleague Dan O'Brien just put up a slide. This is a survey link. Uh, if folks in our audience have two minutes to share their feedback with us, we'd really, really appreciate it. Uh, we read every response. Um, and we did, uh, I'm, I probably should have said this in the thank yous, but thank you to our audience. We have tons and tons and tons of questions uh, that came in. If we weren't able to get to yours, I'm, I'm sorry for that, but we did get to quite a few of them. Um, but please uh, take a moment if you had any audio issues, video issues, ideas for future sessions. Uh, like I said, we really do read every response. And so it's very valuable feedback for us to have. Um, we have some additional briefings coming up. Um, it wouldn't uh, be, it, you would know it was, wasn't really me doing the closing if I didn't plug upcoming briefings. So we have um, June 13th, uh, we will be looking at uh, issues around wildfires, uh, which uh, is an unfortunate topic, but a really, really important one. I'm, I'm looking forward to that, learning more about that issue and um, what we can do uh, with respect to climate adaptation and um, resilience um, to help protect our communities. We will also have briefings about extreme heat uh, and the final briefing in this series, which is the Scaling Up Innovation to Drive Down Emissions series, Offshore Wind Energy coming up later in June as well. So please be sure to visit www.esi.org, sign up for Climate Change Solutions, our bi-weekly newsletter. You'll, no one ever regrets doing that. Uh, and then also RSVP for the remaining briefings in our series. And if you want to go back and look at anything that uh, Catherine or Joe or Yvette or Laura or any of our previous panelists uh, said uh, or presented, of course, everything's available for free um, on our website. That concludes our session for today. Hope everyone has a great rest of your Thursday. And we'll see you back soon for our extreme heat briefing, or excuse me, wildfires briefing on June 13th. Thanks so much. <laughs>